They are literally shooting them and then having breakfast next to them. I cannot look them in the eye and tell them, oh, but don't you think it was better for your, you know, grand uncle to have been killed by uh, Stalin rather than Hitler? One party, one leader, one ideology, one religion, one way of thinking, one kind of dress, one kind of diet, one kind of language. We can't say, well, one leader, one party, one ideology, one religion is bad unless it's my religion, unless it's my ideology. Unless it's a party that shares my name. You asked me why it took me so long. I'm sure I didn't dig deep, deep enough all these years because perhaps I too wanted those certitudes and I didn't want bad news. So I don't want a revolution where there's no habeas corpus, where the state can arbitrarily arrest me. So I think the use of the phrase due process was very, very ill-advised at that time on our part in the first statement. And I immediately had tried to, uh, you know, uh, write my own, <laughs> you know, use my own words and write articles trying to explain. Uh, what I meant. I think we have to also think of ways of having accountability within movements which need not necessarily have recourse to the state and to the law. Hello and welcome to the News Minute. I'm uh, Raga. I'm an editor for special projects and experiments at the News Minute and I run Here's the Thing. Uh, it's a newsletter for our uh, members. Uh, today I have with me uh, Kavita Krishnan, a communist leader and activist who has recently decided to quit CPI ML liberation. Uh, that's CPI, Marxist-Leninist liberation. Uh, she's questioned the party's discomfort with criticizing authoritarian, socialist and communist regimes like China and Russia and uh, leaders like Joseph Stalin. Uh, Kavita, welcome to the show. Uh, your decision has sparked several debates with many communists in the country now calling you a CIA agent, etc. Uh, we'll come to those reactions in just a bit. Uh, but my first question to you uh, is really what many people, I think, want to know, right? Why now? Uh, you've been with CPIML for uh, 25, 30, 30 years. years. Not, Nearly 30, 30 years. And uh, if, uh, uh, again, you can correct me if I'm wrong, the Marxist-Leninist uh, School of Communism started with uh, Joseph Stalin. So what's changed for you now to renounce Stalin? Are you still a communist? These are questions that many people would like to know. Answers sure. to that. So, uh, so I think that's a good question. Well, no, actually, the, uh, you know, the Marxist-Leninist, uh, you know, streams does not start with Stalin, it does start with Lenin. And the ML party in particular basically has always had some amount of criticism of Stalin and so on. So I always, you know, as a student and so on, uh, well, in those years, you don't really have internet access and so on. So whatever questions, you know, you get your answers from uh, comrades. And uh, I largely believe that, okay, you know, there is some form of criticism. I wasn't very happy with the wording of the criticism because I always felt that, you know, the using the word Stalin had a lot of metaphysics, was a little weak <laughs> when it came to de describing, you know, uh, mass killings and so on. But then uh, I was always, it was always explained to me as that, uh, you know, Stalin uh, was not a good uh, communist in that sense. He was not, he was not a dialectical thinker. He, uh, you know, uh, treated uh, differences, he did, dealt with differences, you know, instead of dealing it with, uh, dealing with, with it through debate, he dealt with it by sort of eliminating people and that was wrong. And I knew that they had a criticism, I'd always heard party leaders criticize Stalin for uh, damaging inner party and uh, socialist democracy. So for me, that broadly covered a lot of things, you know, so I always felt okay. But I think that um, my discomfort had started growing quite a lot since, uh, you know, the archives uh, have opened up and 2014, the, uh, you know, the Soviet archives in uh, Ukraine opened up. And so since then, there has been since 2017 or so, there's been a lot of uh, literature coming out of um, that, part, you know, by, by historians of that part of the world. And uh, anybody who reads that, and I am a reader, you know, so I am someone who read so if i read uh, you know uh, someone who is a serious scholar who's not a polemician if i read lynn viola who is a scholar of uh, you know soviet peasant uh, studies now uh, her writing before 2017 and then after 2017 you read that and uh, really it you know you find it very difficult to uh, you know not respond with a sense of outrage I'll explain here also some background that, you know, as a, uh, I did not, you know, I was not, I did not come from a Marxist family or a Marxist background. I was drawn to the Marxist, you know, the Marxist Leninist student movement because of my sense of outrage uh, at the growing uh, Hindu supremacist fascism in India. I connected Hindu supremacist politics with uh, Nazism in my mind, which I 
had read about as a child and which uh, I read uh, the diary of Anne Frank like so many uh, so many people do in India and I remember feeling tremendously outraged and uh, you know uh, uh, on behalf of uh, people like her on behalf of uh, you know uh, ordinary Jewish people people who were part of a religious minority in that part of Europe and who were uh, wiped out by by uh, Hitler and by Nazism so uh, that connection was always there and that ability to you know so I feel like I am not a natural politician I'm someone who has uh, who made herself get into politics out of a sense of urgency and duty I am a very private person I was I am not a public person by nature so I was drawn into this in the 1990s in India looking at Hindu supremacist politics around mid rise with the demolition of the Babri Masjid with the uh, violence against Muslims in Mumbai where I was a student in uh, 1992 and all of that <clears throat> and uh, so obviously when on reading these things you read the accounts of uh, you know uh, uh, you, you read the accounts of the uh, the police the soviet police stalin's police of the time who are giving accounts of how they would deal with hundreds of peasants in one night uh, you know torturing them and just arbitrarily deciding okay this lot needs to be killed and that lot needs to be sent off sent off to some siberian gulag and the people do not know what's going to happen to them and they are literally shooting them and then having breakfast next to them and this is not anyone else's account you know it would be idiotic to say oh this is all you know these are this is western media propaganda this that these are just the cold hard archives these are cold hard soviet documents okay so these are soviet era documents by soviet era police telling you these things right so you read those and then of course when the ukraine war broke out then i felt as though i could uh, you know uh, i felt deeply uneasy because uh, i had been reading somewhat about these things and i felt uneasy because all over the world the global left uh, people we have always respected uh, you know Chom individuals like chomsky so many organizations you know tarik ali chomsky so many people they seem to be um, you know all making uh, corbin so many people all making some kind of uh, you know uh, excuses for putin saying all right the invasion is wrong but uh, you know oh na you know the wars because of nato and so on and so forth and i happen to know that that was not true because of the reading i had been doing i knew this was not true i and i began to read even more and then i've read accounts of uh, you know the second world war and what happened in those parts of the world and in ukraine in particular I read uh, historians like Timothy Snyder. I heard him. He's a you know advocate for uh, you know a, an expert on what's happening in Ukraine, and he's a he's a scholar. He is certainly not uh, someone with an agenda against uh, some you know some particular ideology or something. He's a historian. He's a scholar. You may disagree with this or that that he's saying. You may disagree with how he wants the world to be ideally, but the point is, how can you disagree with his references? Okay, <laughs> so you know how can you disagree with the facts? So the facts that he lays out are absolutely there, right? So the point is that the sense of outrage I felt on behalf of Ukraine, and I felt that you know here we are in India, we are fighting fascists here. Okay, how outraged we feel when a German ambassador comes, a German ambassador comes and decides to visit Hedgebar Bhavan and uh, you know pay homage with flowers and touch the feet of some Hedgebar statue, and you feel like saying hello. This Hedgevar guy was, you know, you're partly responsible for him. Your country had Hitler, and this guy was a Hitler, uh, you know, follower. And uh, you are now coming and making, you know, you are just making uh, the fascists in our country look as though they are normal. You know, it's a normal political formation that you are allowed to visit. You wouldn't do that to the KKK. Then you have people, you know, in uh, responsible positions of power all over the world who get to use words like Hindu phobia or something. Now you object to that. You know that that is a part of fascist rhetoric here, and you want them to be able to understand that no, that's not, you know, India's problem is not Hindu phobia. It's quite the opposite. You know what? That's a part of Hindu supremacist discourse. You know, white supremacist discourse. Well, welcome to our world where you have Hindu supremacist politics and power, right? So the point is, at, you know, in the same way I felt for Ukrainians who are, you know, fighting uh, on so many fronts. Of course, they're having to physically fight a war. They are having to go to war and defend themselves against this fascist invasion, the second invasion in since 2014. 2014 was the first one. And they're also having to fight misinformation, which the Putin propaganda machine puts out. And in India in particular, you see the far right, 
you know, saying things which suit them, you know, because the false, the fake news comes tailored to different kinds of uh, mindsets. So the far right says, oh, you know, Putin wants uh, undivided Russia, Akhand Russia, and we want Akhand Bharat, which is what the Assam chief minister has also just said, right? That, oh, India shouldn't do all this Bharat Jodo. You, if you want to Jodo anything, as in if you want to join anything, then you should join Pakistan, Bangladesh, and we should have Akhand, that is undivided India, undivided Bharat. So these are the you know fascist visions or fascist imperialist visions which are matching. So they say that stuff. Then you have um, a, you know a general anti-imperialist sentiment in India and anti-colonial because we are an anti-colonial we are a country that came out of colonialism. We should actually sympathize with Ukraine, which was a colony of Russia, uh, always under the Tsar and then under the Soviet Union. But we don't know that because we have always had Soviet aid and India generally has a romantic relationship with Russia. So we generally don't, we never, we always thought of Ukraine as some kind of lesser Russia, you know, not as a separate country in its own right, right? So the point is, it is a separate country now. And, uh, you know, we have trouble dealing with that. So we have a tendency to say, oh, anti-imperialist means anti-America. And since uh, America is on the Ukraine side of this war, uh, and Russia is on the other side, so we should be, you know, on the Russian side. Or at least we should say, oh, well, you know, both have a point and all of that. So the simple way in which we supported Vietnam, we support Iraq, we support Afghanistan, we support Palestine, uh, even on the left, we are not able to do that with Ukraine. And there's all kinds of arguments you hear and absolutely false, refutable, you know, uh, demonstrably false things like NATO's, NATO's uh, the reason for the war or there are Nazis in Ukraine or... Uh, you know, uh, the whole problem is if Ukraine were to be willing to give up its Russian speaking areas or give them autonomy, that's all Putin wants really and stuff like that. And that's all. I mean, uh, you know, I would I won't go into details here, but I'll just say that if anyone wants, please read uh, Timothy Snyder's Substack uh, uh, latest, uh, you know, article, which is on Nazis, nukes and NATO or what the ra war against Ukraine is not about, you know, uh, go there. There's lots of references there. So I started arguing on these things and I, I argued with the full confidence that I felt all right uh, on the basis of facts, people's minds can change. That's what I thought. Well, uh, boy, was I wrong. OK, so because I realized that just as you argue with the far right and you try to argue on the you, you know, you want them to give up a very beloved narrative and a beloved story and they can't give it up even when they are suffering the consequences, you know. So they believed in Akshedin and Modi. And now, you know, they are jobless. They are, uh, they may be paying, you know, they may not be able to pay for food. They may be suffering. And yet there is something that makes them very loath to give up on that narrative. And I always have maintained that if you don't understand that, if you just demonize the average Modi supporter or voter, I'm not talking about the carders, but I'm talking about the average, you know, supporter, voter, whatever. If you don't have that sense of why is that person invested in that story? And you are able to give them some other story which is compelling, but which is based on facts and truth. It's not enough just to fact check, because that is simply isn't enough. Uh, you are not living in a world where simple fact checking does, right? So I, I, this I would face all the time in, in politics in India, right? That you're trying to argue and trying to convince. And then I was faced with a situation where uh, in my own circles, I was completely unable to uh, get people to acknowledge facts. Absolutely not. And then when I dug deeper, I realized that in part it is because there is the sense that if you recognize what Russian nationalism and fascism today is, then basically you have to, you can't really leapfrog from Lenin and then directly, you know, Lenin and the Bolshevik Revolution in 1917. And then, ha, you know, you leap, you do this wonderful leap and you come right to this nice rosy, the situation where you're able to say, okay, Putin, bad man, okay, Lenin, great man, that you can't do that, because you have to go through what, you know, these wonderful possibilities that opened up in 1917, uh, the very many challenges and difficulties faced by the revolutionaries and many, many, uh, you know, bad, uh, bad decisions made, even by the leaders we revere, including Lenin or Trotsky or whatever. But then you also come to the Stalin regime, which is a different order of things. There you have a regime which was which completely extinguished all revolutionary possibilities, all democratic possibilities. All power was centralized in one man, one uh, you know, one center, and there was absolutely no uh, room, you know. So the simple thing that we are realizing now in India, right, that we are fighting in India against 
uh, the attempt of the Modi regime, they keep saying we want an opposition free India, opposition Mukt Bharat, Congress Mukt Bharat, that means opposition free India, one party, one leader, one ideology, one religion, one way of thinking, one kind of dress, one kind of diet, one kind of language, all of that, right? Hindu, Hindi, Hindi, Hindu, Hindustan, whatever. So when you fight that, you can't, I felt uh, very divided inside myself because I felt as though we can't say, well, one leader, one party, one ideology, one religion is bad unless it's my religion, unless it's my ideology, unless it's a party that shares my name, unless it's a leader of whom it's my leader, you know, if it is my leader, religion, ideology, whatever, you know, whatever, uh, party, whatever, then it will uh, be benign and then it will work for everybody. Then you don't need, you know, then you don't need to argue for uh, protections for the citizen from the might, from the power of the state. And I think that we all know what the weaknesses and, you know, the hypocrisies of liberal democracies are. They say they talk a lovely talk, but they walk that talk really badly. Most, you know, ordinary people, poor people, oppressed people don't have those, uh, you know, the access to those freedoms. But at least we have learned, and that's my last point in this answer, the last, you know, what we've learned in the course of these struggles is that these protections of civil liberties are important, that certain democratic checks and balances are important. You, I absolutely am a leftist. I would call myself a Marxist. I would call myself a, you know, communist if communist means, uh, you know, absolutely believing that you need a collective struggle for the transformation of society and uh, a classless society eventually. Absolutely. But the point is that I believe that whatever problems there are, totalitarianism is not a solution to those problems. It is far worse than whatever problems there were. So whatever you build, whatever better society we are out to build, we have to recognize that, uh, you know, we want uh, those same civil liberty protections that we are fighting for now, in uh, right now. And so, you know, what I say to my friends is that uh, Emma Goldman used to say, I don't want a revolution where there's no dancing. I say, oh, I don't want a revolution where there's no habeas corpus, where the state can arbitrarily arrest me and, uh, you know, without producing me, uh, can, can basically do what it do what it does. We know that we are fighting for that in India. We are we are aware that it's violated in India, that principle. But surely in a revolution that, uh, you know, you aim for, uh, you would be you'd want that, you know. Yeah. So my next okay. question to you, Kavita, is uh, I want an honest answer to this, right? Is yeah, there a difference between uh, the left and the right when it comes to this Andh Bhakti? It's something that you've just touched upon. Uh, why are devout followers on both sides so ready to go over war, go to war over like criticism, right? Is there a problem you see in the left as a whole? This refusal to engage, but instead like attack when their idols are questioned, whether it's Stalin or Savarkar. Do you see a difference yeah. between this Andh Bhakti? Yeah, no, I think the phenomenon is very much the same and the motivations are very much the same. I'll tell you where they come from. They, it comes from a deep sense of insecurity. Um, and again, I say that, uh, you know, I feel that I cannot uh, set out to change minds if I do not uh, empathize to some degree. I mean, I, I, I need not sympathize with, but I do need to understand why that person reacts that way. So I try to do that even with the more vile of the trolls on Twitter. I may block them, but I do understand where they're coming from in the sense that, uh, you know, the tendency is that you have a rigid little worldview and you only consume things which uh, confirm that worldview. OK, you reject everything that uh, and that is the only way that you are able to survive in that, you know, in your tiny little ecosystem. Right. Now, the point is that any the moment you engage, uh, really engage with an argument, right, uh, that minute you are actually pulled out of that world because in order to engage in an argument with and I find this in my own self, I also have often had pat replies when I'm feeling tired, I'll just give the pat reply and be done with it. Right. Or tell myself in my mind, oh, that guy who's asking the question, oh, he's that guy. He thinks like this. I'll put a little label on him or her and forget. So I think that the minute you start really engaging with a question and not with a person, not with a person whom you're able to dismiss uh, by saying, oh, so and so is biased because, uh, you know, they're paid by so and so, they work for so and so, they believe in such and such, they are of this religion, this ideology, whatever. If you really start engaging, even with those who are your opponents, what happens is uh, what happens is that you are, uh, you know, you have to start 
uh, you do become, you know, you are humanized. You stop becoming a robot and you become a human being, right? So when you do that, uh, I think it makes your, uh, your argument stronger. It makes you uh, be a better persuader, a better, a better, uh, a better activist in my mind. But the problem is that I think that those who are, uh, you know, given this job by their respective parties of just doing this mindless trolling, their training is it's like soldiers. You can't afford to look at your victims as human beings. I'm just saying that I know that soldiers have gone through this, you know, that if they're suddenly struck by the horror of what they're doing in a conflict area with innocent people or something, then very often they can't continue. So you are trained to somehow keep yourself off that. So you're only trained to respond with a certain template of abuse. So you, you are, you know, instead of engaging with my actual arguments or facts, what you say is, Oh, these are not facts because your source is Timothy Snyder is from Yale. And so, you know, Yale is an American university. Americans are imperialists and therefore Snyder is an imperialist. And therefore, I don't have to read his book. I don't have to read his article. What he's saying simply can't be true. You know, I won't engage with uh, I won't engage with, uh, you know, uh, New York Times uh, report on a batch of leaked files from the police uh, files from the Uyghur concentration camps. Clearly, these are not re-education camps. I mean, it's horrendous. You cannot look at those photographs and look at those photographs of children and old women and people there and not be moved. So you won't look at it at all. You'll say New York Times, America, therefore imperialist. Oh, look, 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 Jia, 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 she's reading New York Times, you know, an apple bomb. An apple palm, all neocon, this, that, you know, of course, you know what somebody's ideology is. But the point is, is that person, you know, can, can you read someone whom you disagree with largely philosophically, but also appreciate some insights, some scholarship, proper references, all of that. Surely you can. Anybody with a mind should be able to do that. We have to be able to do that. Now, the point is, if you don't do that, uh, uh, you know, if you tell yourself, you're, then how are you different from the sung person who is trained to say, I will believe the WhatsApp forward by my uh, Shaka Pramukh or whatever, not Romila Thapa, because Romila Thapa is from JNU. How is that different from saying Timothy Snyder is from Yale, so I won't read him? It's exactly the same thing. Or you say, OK, uh, New York Times. So it's exactly like saying, oh, your source is Wire, you know, so Wire or uh, News Minute or whatever it is, XYZ. These are all, or, you know, these are, I don't believe them because they are such and such. It's Ravish, so we all know what Ravish is. So you are not engaging with arguments. You are simply trying to uh, dis discredit the person making the arguments or the source of the arguments and the facts so that you say, I will only believe these facts which fit my worldview. I think that that is, uh, uh, you know, uh, you asked if the left and right are the same. Yes, that instinct is very much the same. Uh, certainly, we all have the tendency to that instinct, to confirmation bias. I'm sure. But I think the difference is that you see that kind of thinking strengthens the right. That kind of thinking weakens the left. So the left at its best is a politics which is uh, which engages with reality, which, uh, you know, uh, Marxism uh, is uh, really, you know, at its best when you're able to uh, see the connections between things that otherwise your, uh, you know, your ideological blinders may not have let you see. And we all have ideological blinders, by the way, even if you're not a Marxist or a Sanghi or a Congress person or whatever, you may belong to no party. But the way in which you see the world is not ideology free. The whole point is to keep asking yourself, am I really seeing the connections here or am I missing something because I don't want to see it right now? And I think that that process is something we all should do. You know, uh, and for the left, uh, the minute it turns Marxism into a religious book or, you know, it says, OK, these are the rules and you are not allowed to break those rules or look out. You can only speak in this approved language about this thing and you cannot, you know, uh, make mistakes. You are not allowed to try out something else, some other way of looking at these things. I think that weakens the left. And that is the big difference. That is why I am still a leftist to the core. You know, I am absolutely a leftist to the core. I am a, you know, partisan to the core. And I keep telling people that, you know, you can take the Kavita out of the CPIML, but you can't quite take the CPIML out of the Kavita because it's deep down there, you know. I still feel and think like, uh, largely like an, uh, you know, somebody who has been a very, uh, a part of the ML movement. It's a part of me. It's a part. It's, it'll never stop being a part of me. Yeah.
Right. So why do you think that is, Kavita, in terms of, um, why is the left still, it's not like, you know, coming to terms with past, past atrocities committed by socialist re regimes, like what is holding them back? What is holding? See, the I think there's a very fundamental problem. I won't, you know, I, I, I'm glad you asked that question because I think that there are very pat answers that a lot of people are giving uh, where they're saying, you know, the idea is the, uh, you know, the, 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 the stereotype about the left that, oh, these are all these dogmatic, you know, uh, or doctrinaire uh, people and all of that. And of course, there are those, there are that kind, you know, you do have that kind in the world, no doubt. And the trolls are definitely that kind. Okay, so uh, no doubt. And, uh, you know, uh, the point is, I think about those whom I really admire, whom I've learned from, who are my, whom I still think are some of the best people in Indian politics and in Indian society. They are people who have led very courageous movements at great cost, personal cost, uh, which are which have democratized uh, Indian society when it comes to gender, when it comes to caste, when it comes to class. Uh, you know, and these are remarkable achievements, absolutely. So when I talk about the MLI, say it with all that in mind. Then I ask myself, why is it that there is so much resistance to this? And the answer is not as simple as, OK, you know, these people are just doctrinaire or whatever. I don't have an easy answer, but I do think that it, it speaks to a larger uh, problem uh, we all face right now, not just the left. I think that all over the world, you have this global rise of authoritarianisms and uh, fascisms. And we all know that, you know, we are in a position where uh, the left in almost all the countries is on a back foot. You may stand for a lot of very courageous moral struggles uh, sometimes, but sometimes you're old. The left has degenerated into these little bureaucratic uh, kind of very uh, almost, uh, you know, synonymous with the state and they have been part of state violence and so on in some places. In other places, they are the victims of state violence and victims of state uh, witch hunts and so on. But uh, at its best anywhere, the, the left is really trying to come to terms with this world that is changing very fast, right? Not only the left. I think that everywhere, any form of democratic politics is now, uh, you know, trying to come to terms with a world which is literally changing every day. Okay. Whoever thought that in America, you may have a president who won't accept an electoral defeat and who will try to launch an armed uprising. Okay. These are bizarre times, you know. So I think, or the idea that there can be a Pegasus software <laughs> that can be used to literally track us inside our bedrooms. Okay, these are not normal times. So I think what happens is that there is a, maybe I'm trying to understand this myself. I see it in myself too sometimes. The feeling that I want to hold on to some certitudes in a world that is continuously changing, surely there are some certitudes. And if you start, and I'm sure I did that too, you asked me why it took me so long. I'm sure I didn't dig, dig deep enough all these years because perhaps I too wanted those certitudes and I didn't want bad news. I didn't want to think that, uh, you know, I wanted to think, okay, people much older than I have already discussed these questions and they must surely have the correct answers. Let me just accept it. But when I actually read those accounts, I could not help feeling outrage on part of the victims of those accounts. I don't believe that the people I, I know and I love and admire, if they were really to think, you know, you know, to read those accounts, that they would not react this way. I find it so hard to believe that. But I think that, uh, you know, they, they are afraid to do that maybe right now because they feel like, okay, it may, it may question too many certitudes. But my very strong feeling is that, uh, you know, this is a time to be questioning certitudes. This is a time to be doing that, because if we want to build an imaginative, robust politics, then we can't be doing it on the on the on the back of very stale certitudes, especially those that simply are incoherent. They render us incoherent inside. I felt incoherent inside if I'm not able to say, OK, one party rule bad in India, one party rule bad anywhere. OK. People knocking on the door and grabbing you, disappearing you and killing you off and uh, claiming that you are a terrorist and you are doing a terrorist plot against the leader with a capital L and you are a foreign agent. Bad in India. Bad under Stalin. He said it about Jews. He said it about, uh, you know, Trotsky, Zinoviev, Kamenev, who were Jews. They were Jewish communists and he said they're Hitler's agents. What nonsense that would be like saying, you know, that, uh, you know, Muslim leaders are today Modi's agents or something. What nonsense, you know. So this is uh, this is so disturbing when you come. I, I agree. I sympathize with those who find these facts hard to read. I find I cannot read these books at one sitting. OK, they have, uh, you know, uh, 
you know they have made me they have made for many sleepless nights let me tell you but i felt as though i could not uh, really do what work i am doing in india uh, you know argue on the on this minute of civil liberties try to explain to people why what is the rationale of democratic democratic civil liberties and why it's important and at the same time in my mind feel like i am doing an injustice to not just 70 years ago people 100 years ago people but their descendants are facing you know the consequences of all that today in ukraine in poland in uh, eastern europe come on they still are so surely at the very least we owe them the truth you know and surely the truth uh, will uh, make our politics better that's what i feel that's all right so uh, the tweet that uh, you sort of first replied to was about uh, china and a story in new york times about authoritarian regime in china why is the left so wary of criticizing china in india what is happening over there what well, do you think i think it's different uh, see again the left in india there is diversity i'll tell you that you know uh, basically the cpm position and the position of uh, cpm people like vijay prashad and all i find quite uh, you know quite abhorrent if i use the word uh, strong word because their thing is to openly defend all of this and say okay it's a war on terror what do you expect you know uh, so at least they're not invading a country in the name of so it's what about the okay america invaded uh, iraq in the name of war on terror uh, china isn't doing that it's just reeducating people what's wrong with education even the us you know they had to educate the uh, lesser civilizations like the indigenous people of america i mean i've heard i have read these things in an interview and uh, with vijay prashad and i'm you know how on earth are these leftist views my you know what 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 do you say to this this is abhorrent i do plan to write about all of that uh, in the in the future but the point is that i feel as though it's so it's so clear the uyghurs are a uh, oppressed nationality okay any marxist what's their salt has to say oppressed nationalities have a right to self determination they are fighting a struggle for self determination it is standard template for any state to brand a struggle for self determination terrorism that's what and there was one incident and they are you know milking that for all it's worth all along and they are literally saying that to you know if you wear a beard or if you say prayers or if you don't drink on the basis of islamic faith then you're you're having terrorist ideas and we have to reeducate you and they are randomly rounding up people putting them into camps i mean what are these these are not call them what they are they are concentration camps concentration camps are when you concentrate people of a certain community certain identity into one place and do not let them leave okay that's what's happening there and you just uh, you know every time there is evidence you say you deflect it you know first when i started reading about this i went to the china uh, government of china website i read their documents i wrote in the cpiml liberation magazine which i edit which i used to used to edit uh, <laughs> yeah that still feels strange to say yeah uh, yeah so i i i actually i wrote about all of this based on those documents saying i am not reading any so called western media i am not reading i didn't even know who was adrian zenz then okay they keep saying oh adrian zenz is this bad guy and he he, he is this he is that again you know you just discredit the source the point is when you look at the documents the stuff they're saying there for a minute you know it's like that uh, you know that uh, thing that a lot of people are sharing that uh, a time to kill movie thing where uh, you know Ma- matthew Man- mcconaughey or whatever he gives the speech where he says uh, imagine you know this happened this happened this happened this happened to this little black girl and now you imagine you know wait and shut your eyes and imagine that she is white you know so he he tries to you know say to his uh, you know race racially prejudiced audience he tries to get to them so the point is i tried to you know again i tried to tell uh, you know these people who believe it doesn't happen that it didn't happen i said look at this document and then tell me that this document just imagine shut your eyes and imagine this is not a chinese government document this is a modi government document would you be okay with it you would be writing detailed critiques of it and you would see what it is saying in every word it is so vague it's far worse than uapa it is a blasphemy law document it is basically is so vaguely worded that you could be arrested for any damn thing okay uh, and you and it is an arrest you are not allowed uh, outside uh, uh, free it is a and you don't have any choice because it's either prison or it is the re education camp and this is a terrible concept 
So the point is that if you if you don't recognize that, if you're not able to see that, but I realize that those who are so firm in their beliefs, you know, it is it is built in that they won't, don't want to look at that. In CPIML, however, that was not the case. So they were perfectly happy to see that, you know, their official uh, CPIML official, you know, Party Congress documents and all criticized China on this, on so many things. They criticized criticize the Tiananmen Square massacre. But effectively, they would still say, OK, we are criticizing it as a socialism that has degenerated or that has failed, right? As a worker state that has failed hmm? or not doing well. And then if you really, really push them, they'd say, OK, it's not socialist, it's state capitalist or something. And I would say, but you know, what does these, what do these distinctions mean to its victims? Essentially, what does it mean? You may have any description of its economy, OK? That's not the point. The point is that what is its form its political form is a totalitarianism then the answer would come okay totalitarianism that's an americanized word and it's just there to you know basically equate hitler and stalin why are you equating them i said you know it doesn't help uh, to equate them because they're very different kinds of politics but if you are going to tell me to read the horrors of what went down under hitler and then what went down under stalin before hitler to the same people to the same people in the same region and you're going to tell me that that Hitler one was worse. I mean, uh, I feel rather ashamed because I have met, uh, you know, uh, met descendants of people who suffered at those times. And I know that I cannot look them in the eye and tell them, oh, but don't you think it was better for your, you know, grand uncle to have been killed by uh, Stalin rather than Hitler? So, uh, Kavita, in uh, one of your interviews, I think uh, you made a distinction between fascism and authoritarianism or totalitarianism. Right. So yeah. what are the different ingredients? Like, how are you making that distinction between China and what's happening in India and Russia? What is the difference? Uh, so I'm not again, as I said, I mean, uh, I think that, uh, you know, the differences are not to say one is worse, one is better or whatever. Uh, there are many, many, many things that are similar in terms of the complete concentration of power in uh, the state uh, and the complete, uh, you know, uh, uh, the, the idea that the citizen must uh, the the citizen must be uh, has only one job, which is to um, be obedient to the leader and uh, basically enhance and amplify the words of the leader, uh, that kind of thing. So there are elements of uh, totalitarianism and authoritarianism in all fascisms, right? And these are very very central. But I think that fascism has this one extra characteristic, which is that. Uh, that kind of politics basically tries to make uh, a section of citizens active in a certain way. So I think that the difference is that, you know, uh, like we see in, say, mob violence in India, right? So the idea is that it is a uh, outsourcing of the, the, you know, the violence. So state violence is not concentrated only in the state. The state kind of outsources, uh, you know, a certain form of violence to uh, certain sections of the public. Uh, yes, so I think yes. that the difference, the difference, uh, you know, uh, there are many, many uh, features which are shared between all totalitarianisms and authoritarianisms and fascism. So the idea of all power being concentrated in the great leader, the idea of propaganda, the idea of, uh, you know, controlling all means of communication and turning them into propaganda machines, the idea of, uh, you know, indoctrination and the uh, disallowing any kind of dissent, uh, branding any uh, opponents as any critics as anti-nationals, uh, getting rid of any opposition, uh, you name it, you know, so there's, and, and basically expecting the citizen to be obedient. So this is what, not, what Narendra Modi says about um, citizens have uh, duties and you should focus on duties and not rights. That is basically what uh, China has been, uh, has been, uh, has achieved, hasn't it? So I think that that is, uh, that is to, ex uh, to, to, to some extent, uh, so all these uh, features are absolutely there. The idea that citizens should have only duties, not rights. And if you look at China, for instance, they have perfected this. They have, uh, you know, basically uh, created a system where uh, the citizens are, ex you know, under extreme surveillance by the state. Uh, not only facial recognition tech and all, which Narendra Modi is also using now in India against protesters, but uh, simply the idea that the state has a right to, uh, you know, check how many babies are you having, what are you doing, you know, everything, like every, in every, every, uh, you don't have a sense of privacy, you don't have any kind of right to privacy, the state has a right to be there and surveil everything. So these are absolutely, these are similarities, but I think fascism has this extra feature, which is distinctive which is that it outsources violence, uh, you know, 
from the state to certain sections of people. So fascism is marked by things like these, uh, you know, semis, param, semi paramilitary, you know, non state, uh, you know, armies, basically non state armies kind of things like, you know, brown shirts or something or the various RSS outfits in India. And the idea that, you know, you can uh, you can uh, encourage uh, people to get active and serve the state by uh, doing a variety of things. It, it could just be by going out and terrorizing people who are defecating in public because the great leader has said that it is uh, anti-national to defecate in public. You have to use toilets. So, you know, it could just be that. But it could also be that you go and, uh, you know, find a Muslim and lynch him. Okay, and, uh, you know, you have your own neighborhood lynching just like you have your own neighborhood, you know, Puja Ka Pandal or whatever. So the attempt to uh, basically make people, ordinary people, active on this. And the more people they can get active to do these violent things, the more, uh, you know, successful the fascism is, right? And I think that that is very distinctive. You find that in uh, all forms of fascisms, uh, which and they play to these very emotional ideas about you know, nationalism, which is defined as, you know, hatred and exclusion, right? But I think that to some extent, uh, the, it's the other way around also, that even the totalitarianisms uh, that I'm talking about, they also targeted, and this was something I did not know, by the way, I did, I always thought that uh, the Stalin state was totalitarian, but I did not know, I always believed that maybe it didn't target uh, communities based on identity. I really thought that. But uh, I have, uh, you know, I stand corrected because it did. And so does China. We know China does now. So the idea of, you know, the, the point is the reason why I think we don't, we didn't easily recognize it vis-a-vis -vis the Soviet Union was because we didn't recognize these countries as separate identities. We just generally thought of it as Russia plus. Uh, we didn't think, we just, uh, we didn't think of them as ethnicities, as uh, uh, races as as uh, as uh, communities which suffered uh, which were you know so if you were Polish under uh, Stalin prior to the Second World War before uh, uh, Soviet Union invaded Poland just for being Polish you could be arrested just for being Polish uh, likewise you know uh, you could you were if you were a Crimean Tatar Muslim then you in 1944 all Crimean Tatars were you know picked up and en masse you know forced. Uh, forced to, you know, migrate, uh, like, uh, and a lot of people died on the way, etc. I'm not going into those details, but my point is that you see there. So these features of targeting a certain communities, even anti-Semitism, even anti-Jewish violence, that stuff also happened under Stalin. So it's not, it's not a question of equating. And I'm not saying this defensively. I really think that in order to understand how these things tick, we need to be able to see how they work differently and where they work, uh, you know, similarly. And my point here is, you know, that this is not an abstract academic debate. We are living in India today where you have a Hindu supremacist far right regime which wants to strip Muslims of citizenship and which wants to uh, which is deeply Islamophobic and wants to establish a Hindu supremacist uh, Hindu majoritarian state. OK, now on the face of it, there is immense difference between, uh, you know, this politics, Modi's politics and Xi's politics. Okay, Xi has the Communist Party, he has all those Communist Party, whatever. So, you know, the, the rhetoric is very different, the language is very different, the nature of the politics is very different. There's lots of politics in China, although there are no other parties. Okay, so any any regime has to do politics in order to survive. The point is that it takes some, uh, op, you know, time to recognize that China is essentially relying on Han, Han nationalism, Han majoritarianism. So there's part of that. The, in part, they are saying we will make China great again. I'm using that phrase because Donald Trump used it and just because it's easy to understand because Modi is also saying that India was once great and we will be great when we are a Hindu civilization again, right? So the point is that's very similar. China says we were a great civilization and then these you know, Western upstarts came and subjected us to all this colonialism and they are using that anti-colonial uh, sentiment, just like Modi is using genuine, the genuine, the anti-colonial sentiment is absolutely genuine. Of course, it will be there, but they are using it to justify this, this, uh, this uh, all-powerful regime, which is going to. So they are taking away your rights in order to uh, eventually take care of you. 
Now, of course, uh, you know, uh, somebody may say that, oh, but China's done a better job than India has. Uh, you know, maybe it's undemocratic, but at least it feeds people, you know, uh, uh, surely those are parts of freedom and democracy being, you know, uh, no hunger and, uh, you know, uh, education, health, whatever, whatever. Now, my point is that, you know, I say this in my book, vis -vis Women, you know, Fearless Freedom, that uh, you can't say, OK, I will give you safety and take away your freedom. Freedom is important. OK. And uh, freedom is a part of whatever else you do. OK, so if you're going to say uh, absolutely, I believe that if I look at liberal democracies, which are democracies in form, uh, but I recognize that the people in those the citizens there cannot truly be free if they lack health care, if they lack education, if they are you know, mired in debt, if they are uh, in student debt or farmer's debt or whatever it is, you know, so many things. If you are, if you don't have enough to eat and so on, bhukhe bhajan na hoe gopala, as they say in Hindi, you can't, on a hungry stomach, you're not going to be able to think very much or do very much, right? So it is going to affect your freedom and your, your participation. But uh, just because a state uh, does better and why, why and how they manage to do better is another very murky and awful story where I won't get into that. But, um, you know, just in the case of the Stalin regime, I mean, they did industrialization at the cost of uh, colonizing Ukraine and uh, starving Ukraine, basically, and grabbing all its grain. OK, so, I mean, here we are fighting for farmers' rights. Uh, just think about <laughs> what was done there. OK, it was awful. So my point is, but uh, if you if you are uh, giving if a state is giving bread, OK, uh, then think what about the bread of justice, which is what Bertolt Brecht's, Brecht's poem is, uh, you know, is called the bread of justice. Uh, where basically he's saying, you know, you need daily bread. Nobody can tell you, OK, you ate last year and now you don't have to eat after that. You have to eat every day and it should be fresh. It should be nutritious, etc. This is what about the bread of justice? Bread of justice also must be baked every day. It must be fresh. It must be hot. It must be nutritious. It must fill your belly. Uh, and since you're starved of that, who's going to make that bread? Not the state. He says it's going to be the people. People can make it only if they are allowed to fight injustices, to flag injustices, to talk about injustices. And, you know, and even in a tremendously unjust India or a tremendously unjust and unequal US, if they can fight to say hello, your country was built on built on slavery and uh, uh, you know settler colonialism and uh, imperialist violence, and you better now start teaching that reality to students today. I'm demanding it. You know, people are doing that even in the U.S. of A. So why is it that we would not want that you know uh, to happen in you know the uh, the former Soviet regime or in China today, right? What about the bread of justice? Where is that bread of justice? So I think that, you know, uh, just saying, OK, bread there, I'm giving you bread, so I don't have to give you bread of justice. You don't deserve that. And we citizens are basically going to be subjects and not active. Uh, you know, their only job is going to be obedient soldiers in the regime, you know, kind of thing, doing what the regime asks of them, demands of them, you know, that is uh, that does not make for a good society. That's terrible, you know. Um, so I'm not sure if I've gotten away from your question a little bit, but uh, yeah, I, I I think I just have a yeah. Yeah, yeah related question. I mean, you've been talking about like yeah, yeah. and sovereignties inside these countries regimes, right? right? Like, what about Tibet? Right. Uh, do you uh, have your has your stand on Tibet change? Absolutely. In fact, I, I I you know a friend was reminding me that years ago uh, she told me uh, you know what she had been reading about Tibet, and uh, she reminded me. She's my dearest friend, and so uh, yeah, she does have the right to uh, you know make me uh, remind me not to be complacent and self-righteous. So she said, you know, you trotted out all those party line answers to me on Tibet, okay, about how the Tibet movement was all U.S. funded and oh, it's just religious nationalism, and surely we are against religious nationalism. So I am deeply ashamed that I might have uh, felt that way and said it, uh, or at least you know tried to convince myself and others of that. Um, but I know that for many years I have not uh, felt that way, and especially because of seeing how things are in India, I have certainly felt that, look, partly coming from where I do as a feminist, you know, to me, uh, self-determination uh, is deeply important, whether it is to the individual or whether it is to uh, nationalities. And I do think that, uh, you know, saying that you can't, uh, you know, you can't, you know, India was told, wasn't it, that uh, you can't really govern yourself. And if you govern yourself, you're going to end up, uh, you know, uh, basically you can't, the natives can't rule and you'll just end up fighting with each other and just dying. And what's happening now, you actually have people, you know, imperialist and colonial type racist saying this, that, oh, whatever's happening in India, just blame it on Indians are like this. 
but that's racist. And uh, the point is that if we start saying that, okay, you know, uh, whether you say it about Kashmiris or whether you say it about Tibetans or whether you say it that you guys, if if we let you rule, we let you decide what to do about yourselves. You guys are just going to degenerate into this. You know, you're going to become uh, religious or you're going to become, you know, uh, whatever religious fascists, basically. The point is that that isn't that their, you know, isn't that their struggle to lead? Isn't that obviously they should not be become fascists? Obviously, but the point is to immediately say that if we let them have, uh, you know, the right to decide for themselves, then they would become ISIS or they would become, uh, you know, uh, whatever, you know, uh, Buddhist fascists or whatever it is, is not uh, true. And come on, I mean, in the, you are suppressing Tibet, but at the same time, you, the Ch China is backing the Myanmar military. So my point is, I think, is that... Um, uh, uh, which I wanted to make earlier, but I think I got a little distracted. I wanted to say that, see, here we are in India, and then you have China uh, next door, uh, which is oppressing Uyghur Muslims. You have Myanmar, which is uh, ge you know, doing genocide against the Rohingya people who are having to flee because of that. They're also Muslims. So um, if you have to situate Modi in a larger global context and a larger regional context, can you afford not to talk about Modi and Xi and, uh, you know, the Myanmar military in the same breath? Can, can you not obviously see, you know, it would take a lot of mental gymnastics to not see the obvious, which is that here is this region where, uh, you know, anti-terrorism and, uh, you know, profiling Muslims as terrorists and uh, oppressing them as uh, terrorists is something which is obviously happening on a large scale in very different countries. Okay. I don't have the answers as to why exactly that's happening. I don't have a formulaic answer, but I do know that I would be making a terrible mistake if I didn't do that. My problem is that the minute you start talking about this, then the, 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 the you know what you're told is very often what you get to hear and on social media and so on, even from very well-meaning people, is that you know that's okay. All these debates are fine, but surely Kavita, now was the time to be fighting the Modi regime single-mindedly, and by bringing up all these, you know, sort of uncomfortable issues, you are weakening that struggle. Why you, you know, why do you have to make these comparisons with uh, whatever, you know, uh, with the Xi or Putin, you know, whatever it is? Why, you know, you don't have to do that. You can fight. You fight Modi now. Deal with these debates later. But I put it differently. I put it that you know, uh, these are not abstract debates, as I said. I feel that if you if you put uh, if you cannot put you know in order to put Modi in a global context of rising authoritarians and fascists of various kinds, Modi when he is going to be studying you know what he can do with his regime here, he is not going to say oh I'm a purist I will only follow the far right type. He is not doing that. He is going to use facial recognition technology. He is going to take a leaf from China's book. And use facial recognition technology here. He's gonna, if he could run India the way China uh, runs, uh, you know, chi the China is run, he'd do it. It's another matter that he hasn't yet gotten there, and we are fighting him at every step, and we are trying not for him not to get there. But the point is that if he could, he would. Hitler, he supposedly hated socialism and the left and all of that, but he uh, took a leaf from Stalin's book. He realized, oh. So you can do mass killings uh, using guns. All right, I didn't realize that. So you know, most of the most of the uh, Holocaust, most of the pogroms, Holocaust was done using guns because he saw Stalin uh, kill people in millions, uh, you know, just by shooting. Uh, so he said, all right, that's a good idea. Let me do these mass graves, line people up there, shoot them, and let them fall into the graves. You know, how efficient, wonderful. Oh, okay, good idea. I've taken it. You see, so when the when these when these horror shows are borrowing from each other without this thing, you know, why on earth are we going to put on ideological blinkers and not see? We are not able to see whole then, and that is going to that. In fact, that is going to weaken our struggle, is what I'm saying. I'm not here to make any easy comparisons or easy pat answers. Oh, this is better. That is better. I'm in fact for giving up all the pat answers. And really looking at new at what are the new challenges we are facing. We used to think the world was dominated by the U.S. Um, and U.S. imperialism was the worst thing. And of course it was. And it still is uh, something uh, obviously a, a, a bad force in the world. But the point is that right now you're having a situation where Russian fascism is trying to redefine, trying to change the contours of the whole world. 
they are out there theorizing. Putin's theorists are saying this quite openly, by the way. You watch Russian television, uh, and uh, there's this woman who does this very useful sort of uh, translation for Russian television to tell people what horrors are happening there. You have people coming on there and saying this, that mm -hmm. Russian civilization, great old civilization, Chinese civilization, great old civilization, Hindu civilization, which is what they call India, great old civilization, uh, the whole Middle East, you know, the great Arab civilizations and all of that. Who, why should we run things according to these, you know, these uh, 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 chits who are born yesterday and are trying to teach us, you know, Western liberalism? What is all this human rights talk and all? That's all liberalism. That's all Western. This is something Ram Madhav writes in the Indian Express uh, op-ed. Okay, he says this that all this talk about, you know, constitutional morality, etc. It is basically just Western liberal talk. Nehru was a Western liberal. For the first time in India, you have a government that is really of the people because. Uh, it is it is resonating with the people like Trump's regime was resonating with the people in America and all of that. He says this. So the point is, if you can't see the connections there and if they achieve the world they want here, we are saying, OK, American imperialism is bad. So uh, we need more poles, multipolarity to compete with American imperialism. But do we really want, uh, you know, multipolarity in the terms of, you know, say, hey, Putin's and G's and Modi's? and Bolsonaro's and whatnot. I mean, uh, come on, we have to understand that uh, that is not the way that, you know, those formulas are not the way that we can think and to recognize that the world is changing, uh, that uh, Russia is trying very hard to undermine democrac democracies, functioning democracies with all their flaws and weaknesses. Whatever flaw you want, I'm absolutely there to say it's there. And I will say that we must fight for something better than those democracies, absolutely, for a revolutionary change. But the point is right now you're fighting a defensive battle. We are not doing any revolution right now. We are fighting a defensive battle when in India we certainly are very clear that here we are saying save the constitution, save democracy. Are we not? Those are the slogans everybody on the left is raising. So right. if you're doing it in India, what about in the rest of the world? Yeah. My next few questions are about India, right? So when you sort of left the party, you talked about wanting to be a part of different people's movements. Uh, so I want to ask you a little bit about that. So some of the biggest issues sure. in the country today, caste, gender, civil, liberty, uh, civil liberties, federalism, relationship between the union government and state governments. So uh, what do you make of the participation of women, especially in leadership positions in left parties, in left movements in India? What about the inclusion of Dalits in leadership positions? The Politburo has only recently managed to bring in a Dalit person. And there is no real position uh, the left India, India has taken on LGBTQI issues. So how do you see all of this? Um, no, some of that is a little inaccurate. Let me put those in context and just put the facts straight and then go on to answer you. Uh, actually, uh, yeah, the Dalit uh, in leadership thing is not true of CPIML. Uh, we have had, uh, you know, I think uh, right uh, Dalits in leadership positions for a very long time and not general secretary. That's true but absolutely in leadership positions, including, you know, and uh, so, you know, leadership positions, candidates, the party mass in general and all of that. As I said, uh, the CPML has a slightly different path there and a different experience there. Um, gender, absolutely, it's a problem and it's strange because in the movements, actually, you have a lot of women. You have a lot of women uh, below in movements, but, uh, you know, as and you do have some very, very remarkable women leaders, but uh, definitely it is way, way far from enough, right? Uh, when it comes to LGBTQ issues, I really uh, uh, remember that in the 90s, it was very hard to raise these issues. And on the left, the left was as a whole very, very, very homophobic. And uh, I know that that gave me a lot of, uh, uh, you know, again, my, I think, discomfort with Stalin first came when I realized that he uh, decriminal, you know, that the 1917 Bolshevik Revolution allow, uh, legalized abortion and uh, decriminalized homosexuality and uh, Stalin recriminalized homosexuality, adopted a very, very homophobic, awful homophobic discourse, sent gay people off, especially gay men to the gulags and, uh, you know, uh, criminalized abortion. So uh, I felt very uneasy as that as a bi person and as a 
uh, uh, in those days I did not have the language even to say say that or speak of it, but it was very uh, like uneasy making, absolutely. And um, I think though that, uh, you know, to give it credit, the left did change their positions on that pretty soon after, the, you know, 2000, 2001 was the nadir, especially when it came to uh, the women's groups on the uh, CPI and CPM, so NFIW and IDWA, they had disallowed a lesbian group from participating in the Women's Day March with their banner saying you can come but you can't raise these issues and all of that and uh, i had it i remember i attended uh, the one of the meetings in which this had come up and they had said that you know surely you have to allow us to prioritize our issues and our issues are the working class issues now remember that i had said that but surely this uh, the issue of uh, sexual orientation is an issue even among the working class how do you know it's not you know so do you not know any working class women if working class women are not comfortable enough to tell you that they're gay uh, maybe our working class men, then maybe something is not quite right, you know. So I think that that was, uh, so that was, I mean, uh, uh, that is something. But very soon after that, I mean, uh, you know, in during the debates on 377, you had some of the best interventions by, I think, a uh, young CPM MP. I remember Arvind Narayan telling me that, and I followed it up, and I saw that, in fact, that was the case. And so, um, uh, so the defense of LGBTQ rights and all eventually in the left has come on board and has in fact, you know, corrected course. I'm not saying that uh, to say that, uh, and I'm just saying that to, as a fact that uh, in, in, right now, and you do have um, LGBTQ persons in uh, leadership and student organizations, at least I have seen that. I don't know about uh, others, but I'm very sure that that's the case. And, uh, you know, uh, at least in my case, I mean, I was a member of the Politburo and I am a woman and a bi person. So, well. but uh, but the point is, I think that you see, um, uh, I think that uh, you know the uh, easy way to look at this is to just very lazily say that the left is you know very bad on all these social issues and all that. But that's not exactly true, you know. So I think that uh, there is a you know, the left has, well, as I said, you know, that there are struggles where a tremendous democratization of society and the question of caste, which is in a lasting change that you can actually feel. People remember this. People uh, say this, and uh, which is what uh, I think people underestimated when during the Bihar elections, when they were so surprised by how well CPIML did uh, relatively, they were quite surprised. And I think that uh, the surprise was by people who didn't quite realize that this is a uh, this is a movement that has very deep social roots and there are you know a large numbers of people who uh, really uh, are willing to fight for this and are willing to fight for the right to vote for it and they do want to see it win you know so i do think that uh, we shouldn't dismiss the uh, very genuine uh, strengths of the left with easy sort of uh, generalizations or easy um, you know contractions of that kind but having said that, I will say that, yes, I mean, um, if I look at it more largely, for instance, in neighboring Nepal, my experience over there is that, in fact, the Nepal uh, left is actually much more resistant to these issues, especially when it comes to feminism. So there's tremendous kind of, you know, conservative uh, stuff. Uh, there's a sense that, oh, Hindu culture is Nepali culture and all of that. Well, on the left and therefore, you know, so don't dress like this. Uh, dress code and in talking to young Nepali women in the communist movement uh, you know I have gone there to take classes and stuff and they have been so happy to hear me speak and they have felt that you know this is and I thought about why it became different in India why the left kind of co correct some of these mistakes far sooner in India the reason is because we had to fight the BJP because we had to fight Hindu supremacist nationalism which made these things their banner Okay, so for them, anti-feminism was their banner, anti, you know, dress codes for women, and, you know, marriage on the basis of caste, you know, um, attacking interfaith marriages, um, attacking women's freedoms, uh, attacking, uh, you know, so, so making homophobia your banner. A lot of that in, in the course of fighting that political force, I think we were educated in a lot of ways, right? Likewise, when it came to, you know, why is it that so many of India's civil libertarians, you know, now, you know, people are, you know, saying, oh, she's talking about liberal democracy and hey, 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 that is all, what liberal democracy, what liberal democratic freedoms, you know, so they're saying OCI agent. But my point is, think about it. Um, 
all the civil liberties we have, most of them, including the eight-hour working day and so on, all over the world, you know, the people fighting for them were working class people. They were people, you know, so the idea of the working class and the left fighting for civil liberties and for more democracy inside a parliamentary democracy structure is not new. I mean, this is stuff we've always been doing. In India in particular, it is the ML movement, which suffered at the, the various ML groups, which suffered uh, custodial killings and uh, fake encounters and custodial torture and so on. They are the ones who, you know, it is from those streams that you had the Balgopal, Kannapiran kind of, you know, the uh, civil libertarian greats and the uh, civil liberty organizations come out. Then they asked very, uh, you know, Balgopal asked uneasy and, uh, uh, you know, com discomforting questions about, uh, you know, the, a very pragmatic approach to human rights and so on, uh, you know, claiming human rights is unmarxist. Again, unless it applies to us kind of thing, you know, so the, I, you know, that, that he asked uneasy questions and, well, everybody should read and uh, read Balgopal and feel discomforted by those questions and think about them. I think that's what, uh, you know, I'm saying basically. Yeah. So my other question on uh, gender and gender justice is uh, the Me Too movement across the world. We've uh, seen it across the world. We've seen it in India. Uh, it's seen some support, some criticism. There have been lots of debates within feminist movements on what is the right way to deal with issues of gender based violence. Um, but before we do, there was uh, Raya Sarkar's uh, list of sexual harassers in academia, uh, the Losha in 2017. And I remember that you had written that you were uneasy with such a list. Uh, where in 2022, we've seen sort of Losha play out, we've seen Me Too played out in many ways over the years. What is your stand on the issue as a feminist? Um, see, I think that one thing I did understand very soon after uh, the first response that uh, some of us had made to that was that the nature of the wording and so on uh, was uh, uh, ill-advised in the sense that it was misunderstood. So the, the statement that came out uh, really did not make for a, uh, you know, a better conversation around that. But I would still say that, you see, my discomfort was not with uh, it was not with anonymous accounts. It was not with people writing on social media about their experiences. It was not about people, uh, you know, naming, uh, you know, their uh, uh, their uh, aggressors and all of that. It was with the idea that you could have uh, somebody uh, just uh, automatically sit and whatever, whoever sends you an account, you just put it on on a list and you say that all these people are predators and. Uh, you don't have the details of what is the nature of what is who is accused of what you know so there's no context there and uh, surely that is a process that is so i think the use of the phrase due process was very very ill-advised at that time on our part in the first statement and i immediately had tried to uh, you know uh, write my own <laughs> you know use my own words and write articles trying to explain uh, what I meant. And I still would say that I, I still think I do not believe that, you know, the procedures we have, the processes we have give give justice, certainly not. But again, I say that I don't think even uh, a complete negation of those processes really gives us any real justice. And I see situations now where, you know, there are allegations made and then there is all kinds of the same things are still going on where people gang up based on, uh, you know, to, to support someone who's accused based on whether he's from their organization, whether he's from their community, whether he's uh, somebody from an oppressed community, uh, whether he's someone from a minority and all of that. And I, I, I am not saying that these concerns are not genuine. I think that sometimes it is, sometimes it's not a blind response. I think we are living in, you know, so surely we all have to sit and think now, right? We are living in a time when uh, you have the police and the state controlled by Hindu supremacists. If a Muslim man is, uh, uh, he may be guilty, he may be actually, he may have done very terrible things. But the point is that uh, in every action we take, we should be careful about how, uh, you know, uh, are we just trusting everything to a state that we know is uh, violent and biased to this particular community. So I feel as though in movements, and I felt this during the farmer struggle as well, uh, where I, it was very disappointing when it came to gender justice. It was terrible, terrible, you know, it was awful. Let me just say that quite bluntly. But I think that uh, in movements, I think we have to also think of ways of having accountability within movements, which need not necessarily have recourse to the state and to the law. So how do we hold accountable? How do we hold accountable keep and without knee-jerk kind of defense, where um, uh, the answer is not just, you know, you uh, punish someone, do this, do that. 
but how do you transform how do you actually hold accountable and transform so if someone is going to be a friend of an accused person can that friend actually have the job of helping that person to be held accountable rather than being a friend who defends that person and you know uh, bad mouths the the survivor right so can we think of that i'm not saying these are easy but i know that people have tried this in uh, for instance the anti racist movements and you know movements of people of color in the us and i've been very interested in those efforts uh, and i really think that we may have to start thinking about that kind of thing here because i do feel uneasy with those things so i think uh, you know it's a question of uh, trying continuously to think about uh, making sure you know it's the feminist and the civil libertarian in me uh, they're both equally active so i keep thinking about how to make sure that uh, you have a way in which uh, you know the a, a, a way of justice which feels like justice to you know most people concerned uh, no easy answers there but well uh, right. yeah i think we so, do have to all be, and uh, one last thing there is that i felt i'll tell you what i felt uneasy about over that whole thing i really had a very hard time over the kind of trolling that happened over that list because i felt as though my entire life's work i have certainly you know i can say with absolute certainty that i have never ever defended someone from who has been from my organization who has been from whatever you know my friends whatever whatever who has been accused and i have not stood with the accuser and not you know i have i can say that with absolute certainty that i have never you know defended uh, someone who is accused i have always helped the survivor to make their you know to to decide on their own and to help them um and to find that suddenly there was all this bad faith kind of the criticisms i really thought about almost instantly as i told you uh, but i think that the kind of you know i remember feeling the sense of feeling very bullied and very i uh, and feeling that there were people who had actually you know i i could see that there were people uh who had you know whose misogynist stuff against me when i had stood with other survivors uh is still online ugly stuff it's still online it's still there or you know there are screenshots or whatever they attacked me with all kinds of lies and this and that and they were coming on board here and saying oh look she's this uh you know defender of predators and this and that and i remember that at some time i'd gone into a very deep kind of depression over that i could not i couldn't literally get myself out of bed over that and i wish that you know i wish that we could have robust differences and conversations mm. without uh, doing that you know without having to really you know uh, and i'm i'm not i'm not happy with my own responses at all moments on that thing either i think i too would tend to react on social media to something and then you know later regret it um and i just wish that we could all kind of uh, you know not assume a bad faith basis for things and uh try to have conversations where uh, we can trust each other not to you know leak bits of those conv we, we may all grow and learn we may all change our minds tomorrow but we shouldn't be you know um uh, at each oh, other's throats <laughs> like that yeah uh so my uh, next question is uh, does the left have an electoral future in india like beyond kerala a couple of other states perhaps uh does the cpi ml have a uh, electoral future in the country you think you know i was just telling a friend just now um uh, i was just telling a friend just a short while ago that look uh, i'm starting to feel like uh, you know the wife who's still cooking for her ex okay so <laughs> as i said i'm still having to answer as though and i still as i said my default setting is cpi ml it's always going to be uh, it has shaped so much of the way we look uh, i look at things and it will always be there so the point is i keep finding myself all the media that's talking to me is asking me to answer for the cpi ml and uh, you know i'm doing that much of the time <laughs> but and i do genuinely i'm not i'm not uh, i genuinely you know believe in the things i'm saying but at the same time i feel as though those are better addressed to you know someone who is a cpi ml leader i shouldn't speak about that but uh, i should say that you know the bihar performance that uh, the ml had uh was uh, something very encouraging and i know those mlas who won and i know those movements uh you know the kind of work they have put in and i really and these are many of them are very young they are from you know uh, uh dalit bahujan backgrounds and uh, uh dalit bahujan minority backgrounds and they are very remarkable uh, people so i do think that uh, i would say that look uh, i keep telling people that look the bjp was in political wilderness for decades okay 
uh, and uh, you know within no you know suddenly there was a spurt and a certain moment came and they you know they suddenly became this huge force which continued to grow and which is where it is today and pretty uh, you know a threat to our entire you know whatever kind of politics we've been used to it's all in threat now it's all in under danger now but uh, you know in the case of the left you know uh, parties may be in power for three decades but the minute there's a loss a minute there's this thing there's this whole writing of you know that starts where people say oh you know oh earlier they used to tell me i remember on a debate on ndtv or something i remember being told oh just three seats you know for the ml <laughs> you know so this is kind of joke that oh she's talking about three seats but i know how those three seats were won okay it was very hard and the point is that then 12 seats now and people are kind of saying okay okay maybe something is happening there so i'm just saying i think it's wrong to write the left off uh, the left uh, should live in movements the left uh, is to be found there uh, the left should not be judged only on the basis of its electoral performance but i do believe that uh, electoral performance also is uh, absolutely you know will improve in spite of the tremendous odds in the way of the left so um, that's what i think and i don't think that uh, as i keep saying i am somebody who is a leftist to the absolute core i don't think that umbilical cord is ever broken and um, yeah i mean i do think that uh, you know whatever i write or think in future whatever i write speak uh, that is all an effort to basically uh, try to help a left thinking and left discourse move forward for its own uh, benefit and for the for the sake of our movement now against fascism for the sake of a global movement against the rise of far right and authoritarian uh, regimes and politics and for our uh, collective future as better humanity we have to you know uh, old models of politics means this planet is going to be finished off so if you don't find you know i'm only saying that maybe maybe just maybe uh we all need to be questioning our absolute certitudes about how things are to be run and that's all we need to be able to you know kind of look around and have a rethink face some que- difficult questions even if we don't have all the answers admit that we don't have all the answers my last question really uh, taking off from that right there seems to be a global sort of resurgence of socialism or maybe it's just on social media do you see that on the ground as well or is it a social media phenomenon see i am not talking about india right now i don't think it is right to say that this is a very ripe moment for socialism and all of that i think as i said i think it's a very grim moment in most parts of the world okay even in chile where you had this really amazing constitution draft uh, it failed to uh, pass the referendum you know so that uh, that tells you how difficult things are and i think that wherever people were getting really excited about or oh, and thinking okay you know you're going to have a corbin as as prime minister or something look at where the look at where the uk is right now pretty terrible okay i mean they have a liz truss and it, she's likely to be worse than uh, johnson was okay so it's really horrible it's a it's a it's not an easy time for the left and uh, we w- we would be making a very big mistake to just uh, you know give ourselves pep talks and say that this is a very positive time covid has in fact um, been used by regimes and this i'm not saying that you know lockdowns are a bad thing or whatever that's not my argument my argument is that the uh, the, the regimes the governments the uh, the the capitalist and other kinds of uh, parties and so on that are in power they have used covid uh, to clamp down and that includes china that includes you know to to regiment to clamp down to basically deny uh, uh, liberties to deny the right to protest and all of that you're seeing that in india so much of the time uh, and it's a very real thing so how to actually uh, you know do that even the handling of covid just this callous you know number of numbers of deaths everywhere india uk usa everywhere and and yet those governments have not really been held accountable for that you know so it should have been a scandal the way these things were handled and the way people died unnecessarily but it hasn't been and the idea that okay people there would be a clamor for a better public health care system because of covid that hasn't really happened yet you know that hasn't really happened yet healthcare is still not a political issue in india to the extent that it should be you know 
so i still find you know this guy and the reason is partly because you know uh, in my experience uh, in bihar speaking to covid bereaved people the idea was that there have been so many uh, so many terrible things that people you know the all kinds of health public health crisis that people have ha always had and so they can't really look at it differently and they're pretty resigned to the fact that maybe you know this is the way things are you know so changing that is not easy so i won't i don't have an easy thing to say there easy hope to offer but i do believe that our survival as a as a as a as a planet de de depends on this depends on finding an answer to all these things including you know the uh, planet yes you know people used to say socialism or barbarism but well the socialisms you had were pretty barbaric but that doesn't mean that we write off uh, the possibility for and the absolute uh, uh, importance of finding some way ahead where you really can get out of uh, this this uh, abs you know this do damning and doomed kind of uh, capitalist uh, uh, you know uh, uh, capitalist uh, treatment of resources and treatment of human beings and the world which is just leading us down a, a total abyss right so we do need to think about how to get ourselves out of that but uh, yeah i mean it will take a lot more hard work and a lot more imagination so not i think not tying um, i just i just ask young people who are listening to this to to say that i am absolutely not telling you that you shouldn't be active in organizations that organized left politics is a bad thing that you shouldn't be in parties that you should absolutely not please don't take that from my decision to move away uh, i think each of you has to path your you know uh, chart your own journey but yes do read do read things that make you uncomfortable uh, do ask questions that make you and those around you uncomfortable because that will improve your politics and uh, definitely it is only that where you know through that experience that we will actually come to a better more uh, you know a, a politics that is able to uh, be truly democratic and have more answers to the terrible problems that we have today thank you so much kavita for joining us uh, this was quite a long and uh, uh, deep conversation and uh, definitely we should talk again and uh, thank you so much uh, to everybody who's joined us uh, for the interview uh, we'll come back with another show